Hello, I'm Don Durham, and welcome to Patent Pod. Our guest today recently published an article in the National Association of School Psychologists Periodical, Communique, titled, Belief-Based versus Evidence-Based Math Assessment and Instruction, What School Psychologists Need to Know to Improve Student Outcomes. The article tackled some of the philosophical beliefs that have been instilled in educators and compares them to the actual findings from quality educational research. I'm excited to welcome Dr. Amanda Vander Hayden and Dr. Robin Cotting back to Patent Pod. Thank you both for talking with us about this article and the underlying issues it's addressing. Thanks for visiting Patent Pod again. I want to um, start off with, and Dr. Cotting, I'm going to go right to you first. Could you help us in identifying what is evidence based practice? And then, Dr. Vander Hayden, I'm kind of going to lead you in there. If you could help us out with understanding philosophy based practices. So, Dr. Cotting, help us out with evidence based first. Let's go there. Sure. Evidence-based practices are skills, techniques, and strategies that um, experimental studies or large-scale field studies have proven to be effective. And what's really important about the opportunity with these practices is that um, educators start off with an effective practice or program rather than attempting selection through trial and error. Um, it allows there to be a greater likelihood that you're going to see positive student outcomes, and hopefully it's a better way to get support from stakeholders because there's data to actually back up the intervention. As long as we've matched our samples, it should work for the population that we hope it to work for. So it's using that scientifically, empirically grounded way to find evidence and outcomes. So versus Dr. Vander Hayden, help us out with that more philosophy-based practice. A philosophy-based practice is just what it sounds like, right? It's that I like this and I think it mm. should work. It's a good idea. Maybe I read about it in a book that someone said this, this would be a better way to teach math. So that is a philosophy-based practice. If it does not have evidence and experimental investigation, ideally published in the peer-reviewed literature, then it's really in the land of a philosophy-based practice. So I do it because I think it will work, but I don't know. And when we think about kind of the difference between evidence-based and philosophy-based, we have to think about the long-term effects. You know, might something that is more um, philosophy-based, I like it, I do it, I have a gut instinct about it, may cause more harm kind of down the road, if I'm not mistaken, yes? Yeah, so this is exactly, you know, parallels what we've seen in the reading world mm -hmm. uh, recently. That, that So whole language instruction and the tactics that go along with that, um, there, there's been a, quite a bit in the um, popular media lately, and uh, folks are really saying that gener a generation of children were um, taught using tactics that were not evidence-based. They were not mm -hmm. aligned with, you know, science, science in how to teach reading. And as a result, those children really did not become proficient readers. And what's most alarming, I think, about that, and I, I really think the math world should be paying attention because the same thing is happening in math and it's coming to us, which is that when we are using philosophy-based practices, so something that we think should work, um, if, we are, if we are doing that in a way that it competes with being able to deliver evidence-based practices, which is absolutely the case in the math world, then we are depriving children of learning over the long haul. And Robin and I think that school psychologists and other adults in schools can be key actors at diminishing this tension between philosophy and evidence-based practice such that we are um, being good stewards of the dollars that we are spending to get the best results possible for students. You know, I appreciate you sharing that, that um, you know, the math world runs parallel to the reading world. That we have this, these tensions that exist in literacy and they're existing in math as well. But I want to ask you, as an educator in the classroom, how do I become self-aware? How do I differentiate between evidence-based practices and philosophy-based practices? How do I do that so that I'm, I'm effective and efficient in my classroom? Well, you know, I, I'm going to say it's hard. This is hard to do because, first of all, what you learned in your uh, pre-training program as a teacher may not have been consistent with best available evidence, right? Um, what you learn in a professional development session may not necessarily be consistent with experimental evidence around what is the most effective way to teach math instruction. So there's a lot of variability in the advice that teachers are given. Mm -hmm. And some of it is high quality and aligned with evidence, and some of it is not. And so I think it, um, it, is, it is a real challenge that teachers face. And 
Um, one recommendation that, that I, I hope we made in our article, but we might not have, is there are sites that have evaluated the evidence around um, math curricula and math supplemental intervention programs. So um, I would recommend the NCII site. They have a tools chart that is fantastic for, for reading tools, also for math tools and for behavior tools for both assessment and also for intervention. I, I happen to like the edreports.org site too that, that provides um, evaluate, evaluations of core curricula in math. Those are good sources to go to. And then, you know, there's just no replacement for testing what you install in your own environment. And Dr. Cotting, can you offer some insight as to how I, at the, as the teacher, can really differentiate between the two and, and become more knowledgeable and more um, becoming more of a critical consumer of what it is I have in front of me? Sure. I mean, I think one of the biggest red flags for me is if somebody says, oh, well, there's no peer review studies for this because it's too hard to study, so we, therefore we cannot study it. You know, that's the antithesis of science. So if, if that is a truth that's being said about something, I would automatically question it. In science, we um, test theories and we can disprove theories and we need to be able to change the recommendations of our practices according to that evidence. So that would be another key red flag for me is if there is a recommendation where there's a lot of counter evidence, but that recommendation is never changed. Mm -hmm. So I think those two things are really going to be important. And, you know, again, it goes back to create schools as evidence-based cultures and data-based cultures. So, um, one of the things that's really important to remember is that we have a legal obligation through the Every Student Succeeds Act to use programs that meet an evidence-based threshold. And one of the categories is that if there is not evidence for a practice that you're using, then you actually need to collect data in order to meet obligation. So we, we should be uh, changing schools into data-based cultures and evidence-based cultures. I think that's a great way to say that is changing the climate and the environment to being evidence-based cultures and data-rich cultures. Um, and I think that's a key piece to, to kind of capture on. So thinking about that and thinking about how we want to start shifting to more of this evidence-based culture, how do institutes and organizations kind of start to reduce that philosophy-based understanding and really push people towards evidence-based? How do we do that as organizations? I mean, I, th I think it's important that those folks who are spending public dollars to arrange professional development opportunities for teachers who then are responsible for learner outcomes really have a responsibility to make sure that they are um, promoting um, practices that that are supported by evidence. And this is not maybe as hard as it might seem because there are sources like the NCII tools chart and you can look at certain practices and make informed decisions about um, whether or not this would be a good investment for your teachers to learn this tactic. Um, so we, we happen to know a, a, a lot about what works for math instruction and, and so we would argue that teachers just can't get enough professional development in tactics mm -hmm. that are uh, around if, um, explicit instruction, right? Sequencing of instruction, high quality acquisition instruction to establish new understandings without confusion. Um, there's also the innovation configuration at the Cedar Center in mathematics that summarizes some of these practices that we know are evidence-based tactics for K-12 learners in math. And, and, and so it really starts with that. I mean, as a, as a leader in a school system, you want to be um, bringing in outsiders who are going to recommend evidence-based practices rather than just uh, maybe an idea or a mm -hmm. thought or a philosophy. And so anything that you run into as a classroom teacher, you can check. You can Google it, you can find the empirical sources that support it or and that supposedly support it, and you can read them directly. That's a good idea for folks to do before you invest your teaching time. So being critical and being mindful of what it is that you're learning about and digging a little deeper um, and really kind of as a, as a group promoting evidence-based practices. Yeah, and avoiding the extremes. When you hear something that sounds extreme, that should be a red flag. Like Robin said, you know, it's too complicated to be studied. That's not true. Any mm -hmm. idea uh, in terms of an instructional delivery mechanism can be operationalized and can be evaluated. And so um, we don't want to expose children to unconsented experimentation in schools. We want to make sure that we are um, introducing tactics that can work if correctly used so we can focus on the implementation because that's, the, that's really the hard part. Yeah. And Dr. Cotting, would, might you add anything in regards to how we can really push organizations and institutes to start thinking along the lines of evidence-based cultures versus philosophy-based cultures? 
Sure. I mean, I think it's really important that the team that's in charge of selecting math intervention and assessment tools is doing so uh, grounded in scientific evidence mm -hmm. and not based on simply testimonials or publisher claims. As Amanda already mentioned, there are numerous uh, sites that can be located to help identify what those uh, evidence-based or um, another term that's used often now is high leverage practices that comes from the Cedar Center or the Iris Center. High leverage practice is simply another way to say, hey, look, using evidence-based practices and you're going to get more bang for your buck. It's worth the investment because they're going to work for you. So it's important that the team that's in charge of making these selections is doing so in an informed way and not just um, based on other people's testimonials, um, no matter how important those people are to the system, and, and not just based on publisher or vendor claims. So be informed. That's the big message here. Be informed. Um, and that may require a little bit of digging. Um, even, you know, I'm not, I've heard people speak to, you know, when it's someone you um, have a tendency to read a lot about or have heard speak or kind of um, are kind of gravitate towards, you want to still be critical of what they're putting out there. You still want to question and dig a little deeper to ensure that you're promoting evidence-based versus philosophy-based. So I think that's a good piece. And, you know, I look forward to continuing our conversation about the article. I think that the tensions you both identify um, and the common misunderstandings and misperceptions are um, definitely something that we need to be having a, a further conversation about, so I look forward to that. Before I let you both go, I do want to ask you, and, and we ask this of all our Patent Pod guests, what advice might you offer to those in the field, particularly as it relates to philosophy-based versus evidence-based instruction? What might we offer? If you could just briefly share a few words for me um, in each of you, if you could, I think that would help our viewers to understand where they should go next. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, avoid the mistakes of the past. So education is is a, a fad heavy industry mm -hmm. yeah. and some someone will have some great idea. Like here's one a learn, learning styles. Right. So if I'm a visual learner, I should get visual input and I'll have better results in terms of learning. And we now know that is absolutely unequivocally not true. But I bet you could go out today and, and purchase professional development to teach you how to do it. And we have to have we have to have a more open mind in our field that what we are doing is, is, is somewhat high stakes because if we miss opportunities to establish learning for kids, then over the long haul, they're going to suffer. You know, I do want to mention a great study that came out of the Florida Center for Reading Research. Um, Kuhn, Sharon Kuhn is the lead author, uh, just published last year. And what this study showed that really got my attention is that if, if you look at children's course sequences in high school, are they taking remedial math? Are they taking advanced math content? And then what their ACT benchmark readiness for college is, so their performance on the ACT, mm -hmm. you do not get a different result for kids who are in the remedial track versus kids who are in the advanced track after you account for what those children knew in fifth grade in math. Hmm. So that's the key. And what that says is what, for children to be able to profit from rigorous content and advanced mathematical learning, they have to have established basic skill proficiency. So what you're doing K-5 really matters. It is high stakes and therefore you really have a responsibility to make sure that you are not sending children forward with a disadvantage for their long-term learning in math. So think about that responsibility you hold and have that be reflective in your practices. Absolutely. Right. And Dr. Cotting, some advice you might offer to those listening today. Yeah, check your sources. I, I think you know, we're in this era where um, the original source has then been um, followed up by a secondary source, then the blogs and websites and other types of social media are picking it up, but now it's not even, it's the summary of the secondary source. So we're in this giant game of telephone when it comes to scientific evidence that the kernel of truth and the context surrounding that truth has been lost. So we need to go back to finding the original sources and figure out what was the actual intention of that evidence-based practice. So digging deeper for the originality and the, those sources to kind of back up the claims. I think those are two good, good pieces to kind of go off. And, and remember the responsibility that we have to investigate a little bit further and, and dig a little deeper. So I, I, I'm so excited and I appreciate that, that advice. I am very excited in continuing the conversation with both of you. Um, for now, we'll say goodbye and we'll continue on um, and other further um, Patent Pod episodes to talk about this article. Thank you both so much for being here on Patent Pod. We appreciate it. Thank you to all of you in the field. You truly inspire educational growth in your students every day. A special thank you to John Ragsdale for producing this podcast. We'll see you next time on Patent Pod.